Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. See why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. Sign up and get a free This Week in Startups t-shirt at newrelic.com slash twist. And by Mandrill, the best way to send transactional email from the people who make MailChimp. Sign up today at mandrill.com. And by AWS Activate, the Amazon Web Services startup program. It's easy to start and scale your business with AWS. Visit aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey everybody, it's tech producer Jacob and this is This Week in Startups. The interview you're about to hear was recorded at Launch Beacon in New York City. Jason sat down with the top folks in retail, e-commerce, beacon technology, and much more. Hope you enjoy this chat with Ryan Craver of Lord & Taylor. Let us know what you think. Tweet at TWI Startups and at Jason on the Twitter. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. So now we're going to actually get to hear from uh, somebody who um, is really dealing with this from the retailer side in a major way. And Ryan is very honest, and um, we had a great discussion about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you're responsible for strategy at Lord & Taylor. Um, how's that going at Hudson Bay? Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting. Um, Hudson's Bay and Lord & Taylor are the two longest-running retailers in North America. So it's definitely a challenge. Um, retail's pretty slow moving with things like Bitcoin and beacons and things like that. So um, it's definitely a challenge, but you slowly make strides. You show some data that proves that we're making some traction and you start to do things. Great. So let's go to your deck here. You have this really great deck that we went through. And, do you have the clicker? Uh, um, yeah. Do we have the clicker? I think this might be the clicker right here. No? Um, I guess this is. Yeah, it goes forward, but not backwards. Um, that works. Here. So, um, you know, I like to show this as the perceived state of retail. I think the comics do a great job of perceptions of what people think actually happens. Um, and this is incredibly interesting to me just because of the fact that this is that typical showrooming customer. The customer's tried on, you know, 50 pairs of shoes, likely being helped from a commission-based associate and then has the audacity to say, you know, what's your Wi-Fi password so I can go shop somewhere else. Right. So it's... Um, is this something that, is a, that really happens often, or is it just something we imagine happens often? We imagine it happens. Um, yeah. It doesn't happen very often at all. So if people have come to the store, they, they probably want it right now. For the and most the prices part, yes. are now getting closer? Like, is that like a mandate? Like, hey, let's try to have the prices online match the prices in the store, or be relatively close? Yes, so our online prices always match what's in store and we do a significant amount of research as to what the other online providers are charging. Ah. So that, that parity is pretty much there. Great, so let's go to the next slide. So what I, what I wanted to do was kind of show what we're faced with as retailers today. If you take a look at 2010 to 2013, we've got a drop of about 50% in the top time in which we have our sales. Um, and, and what we feel is there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, however, what we found is that there's a lot less browsing and there's a lot more purpose shopping. Um, but it's, it's pretty staggering to me. So literally in four years, four, four or five short years, half the amount of visits to stores and you're taking a hit during the most uh, important time which is the holiday season. Exactly. And you attribute this to people buying online or just being more purposeful in coming once and ordering more? Co combination of things, um, you know, buying online from online only retailers, um, natural shift in habits. People have more access to more information about what we're selling in stores, what we uh, can do in terms of fulfilling it to them directly or, you know, if we can fulfill it within an hour up to an hour. Um, and then lastly is 
There's just less browsing. People don't come to malls as a leisure acti activity nearly as much anymore. And when they are coming, they've done the research prior and they're going to one store instead of three stores. Got it. Um, it does seem like the decline is slowing though. Yes. So either you're hitting uh, a certain age bracket that's not gonna change their behavior or maybe, you're, or maybe retailers are changing the experience a little bit. Yeah. I think what retailers are starting to find out is that, and you're going to see it in a few more slides, is the customer's not binary. There's not a 100% online shopper, and there's not a 100% brick shopper. Right. And it's kind of molded where it's a bell curve now where you've got them doing a little bit of each. Um, to your point, it looks like this got a bit distorted with this switch from PowerPoint since I work in an old school retail world and you guys all work in Keynote. <laughs> um, but what this is showing is that every single age group from 14 all the way through 65 plus uh, has the ability to shop online or is willing to shop online. So this is the percentage um, of digital buying by age. Right. Even the oldest people, 60% uh, of them are buying online. Yep. So it's, it's not like anybody is... Um, Safe. Yeah. Okay. Every, everyone's right. shopping online. And you got 90% at the... Yeah, 80, 80s and 90% of people are doing it. Okay. Okay. So for us, media is extremely important to understand just because of the fact that that's how we tell our customers what we've got in store, what is on sale, and it drives a majority of our foot traffic as well as acquisition of new customers. Um, and the takeaway here is that the amount of time in total that's spent within these various medias has gone up. However, it's all mobile, as we all know in the room. And, and this is per day. This is per day. So you can see mobile going from 20 minutes a day all the way to 2 hours and 21 minutes a day. Exactly. 10x. Exactly. Or no. Yeah, it, like 9x, yeah. So... For, for us as retailers, you know, we have to change the way that we're messaging our sales. And it just, it doesn't have to do with, you know, what product we put online, but it's more alerting the customers of what we've actually got. Yeah, and newspapers and magazines are just getting walloped. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Which is not surprising. Wow, this is really depressing. Let's keep going. Well, don't worry. Don't worry. You know, it's funny, I gave this exact, not exact, completely different speech about three weeks ago in uh, San Francisco, and the entire room was Facebook, Google. So they were cheering. They were like, this is amazing, great, great job, and they said, you know, you're not a cash cow, you have no money to do anything in retail, and so I was like, hey, I'm yeah. from retail, guys, you ready? you ready to see some great slides, but it will, it will turn around. Okay, so we're looking at here, U.S. retail versus non-store sales. Right. So what does that mean? This, basically what this is showing is retail is not dead. It's still, you know, close to 90% excluding auto, brick and mortar. Brick and mortar with an online website. The online only retailers are only accounting for 11.5% through Q1. Um, so the retailers who have online, like Target, or... No, like Amazon. Like Amazon. Or Guilt Group. Yeah, though those are the gray bar, right. online only. Right. But if Lord & Taylor's or, you know, Eddie Bauer are doing both, they would be in the blue line. Right. Ah, got right. it. And, um, you know, again, they are growing over the course of this, this period, 2009 to 2014, um, faster, but they're arguably growing on a much smaller base. So it's not nearly as large. Got it. So when we talked about earlier, you're not 100% brick or you're not 100% click, this is the slide that I like to use to demonstrate that no customer is the same. On the far right-hand corner, you've got someone who is 100% click, which we like to call show rumor. Um, and then on the, on the far left side, you've got someone who's, who's brick. And how you cater to them, whether it's through marketing or product or fulfillment, differs for each one of them. But the showroomer is that person that's coming into the store, likely going onto the Wi-Fi network and purchasing via Amazon. The leisure shopper is opening their newspaper on a Sunday, finding out what sales are there, and likely not signing up for your email and likely not shopping online. And then that blur is in the middle where you've got that researched customer who's using the mobile sites, who's using the websites, and then even the web rumor who is 
going into the store to try on and purchase and just researching online. Interesting. So let me ask a question. I'm going to ask you if you see yourself as a showroomer, the middle section, or leisure, which would be, I'm going to ask that to the audience. It's awesome. Okay, so how many people uh, consider themselves a showroomer? They just buy everything online. How many people consider themselves a leisure person? They just do everything in store. And how many people are in the middle? Okay, well, there's the answer. I mean, um, and do you see a trend of like the showroomer becoming a bigger trend where like young people are just going to be showroomers eventually and all the rest of us will be dead? Or is this like a, is that middle section going to become the standard? I, th I think the middle section is going to become the standard. I think, you know, if you look at every single retailer, they're coming up with similar ways in which they excite the customer. You can purchase it online, you can bring it into store, you can reserve it uh, online and get it in the store. So I think it's naturally evolving all the customers into that middle section. Well, it makes sense because all of the uh, e-retailers or people making products online are talking about building stores. So Fab launched their furniture store. Warby Parker obviously has both. Everlane, yep. which I almost invested in, was a really interesting company making like $15 t-shirts that are almost as good as the $35 James, per James Purse ones. They start doing flash shells in stores and physical locations. So it seems like everybody's going to wind up in the same place. Yep. But that last part I thought was super fascinating, which is I order it online, I get it delivered the same day, or I pick it up. What's going on in that space? Because that to me seems like the holy grail. And we had eBay. eBay Now. eBay Now. But supposedly that was a failure or mismanaged and is closing down, I read. And then you have Uber doing Uber Rush here. And then you have Amazon doing their own same-day delivery. Yep. And then there's a bunch of same-day delivery startups in the Valley. And then you have Postmates, too, yep. which you can send or TaskRabbit. Yeah. So is that the future? Like, I order something online and I, somebody chases me down the street because they know I'm, like, eight feet in front of them. Like, Jason, here's your AAA batteries. Right, right. So I think what we found ourselves is, is, one, no one's willing to pay a premium on shipping. And everyone expects free shipping. Got it. And free returns. That's the Amazon Prime effect. That's the Amazon Prime effect. You know, you look at all the top retailers, they've got a threshold where they're giving you free shipping, and typically it's pretty easy to meet. Um, the second thing that we've found is that no one's willing to pay a premium, even if they're in trouble, and they need that product that day. So they're not willing to pay a premium. They're likely going to go to a store. So for our customers... If we can't give them that same day, what they're going to end up doing is going into a store that's in close proximity to, to them. And if we don't have one there, we're kind so of... So they won't pay the... What would it realistically cost to get people same-day delivery, do you think? 15 bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks? What will retailers be able to do it for and not lose their shirt? Uh, it's, it's right around 15 20 dollars. I think what you're seeing from the larger providers, the online-only retailers, um, is... To get around that, they're building the DCs closer to the end customer. So the demand chains are shrinking. The reason why an Amazon or someone else can potentially get it to you in a day without throwing it onto a courier in Manhattan is because the DC is right across the river in New Jersey. So I think um, they're going to try and avoid charging. And we need to ready ourselves as if they're not going to charge. And we do need to provide that service if how we want to. How many sale. people here have done same-day delivery from one of these services? Raise your hand nice and high recently. Yeah, like recently. Interesting. What did, what did some people pay? Did you pay anything? What did you pay? Do you remember what you paid? Anybody? 15 bucks? Nothing? $5? Who'd you pay 5 bucks from? Oh, eBay now? Interesting. That was the example we talked Yeah. About. Has anybody paid, like, above 10 ever? And for who? No. That's interesting. So eBay Now is big in New York, huh? And it's going e away. eBay Now is a fantastic service. Um, you know, but I, there must be, if they're doing it for $5, they're losing money on every transaction then. So it's like Cosmo all over again. Yeah, I mean, the example I've got from eBay Now is I, uh, I think I told you I wanted an Xbox One game. Yeah, total dork, sorry. I wanted it then and now. Um, and I paid, f I, I'm on 42nd Street. The target was at uh, 117th, and that's, you know, just going on to Google Maps, that's 38 minutes by bike. And they deliver, they promise within one hour, and they charge you five bucks. I, don't, I can't see how that's sustainable. Yeah, I mean, if you increase the volume, you're not going to make it up in volume. You're just going to lose more money. So, um, I think there's some use cases where it will work. 
you know, what parts, does the use case where it will work? Use case where it work? Parts of Manhattan, and if you restrict the size, I mean, it, obviously, guys like Seamless and Grubhub have made it work on bikes with food, which has uh, much better margins than retail. So there's going to be some use cases where. Yeah, it works. I mean, I used Postmates when I was in San Francisco, and I realized after I used it that I. It was $55, but I didn't actually read, like, what I had spent, and it was really $35 in food and, like, $19 in right. a service charge, a delivery charge, and a tip. Right. Um, and I was like, I don't think that this is going to be super sustainable. Ah, uh, yes, new relic, new relic. Application performance on a very granular and detailed level. I use it at Inside. I use it at launch for the ticker. I get weekly updates on email of how my services are doing. Now, listen, I'm the CEO. I'm the boss man. I don't need to get down into the nitty gritty of our application level, but I like to get that top level summary so then I know what the heck's going on. I know that our services are fast, I know they're stable, and my team loves it, as do the teams at Nike, Warby Parker, Airbnb, Comcast, AT&T. I could sit here for an hour and tell you impressive names like that that use New Relic. New Relic has an amazing new product called New Relic Insights. Uh, and you can ask your software questions like, how many people signed up for a free trial today? What is our revenue by geography? How many unique visitors completed checkouts? All this kind of stuff. Insights is amazing. It's sort of putting together growth and data with how your servers and how your infrastructure are working. Great new product from them. Go check it out, newrelic.com slash insights. And go to newrelic.com slash twist and get a free This Week in Startups t-shirt. They printed This Week in Startups t-shirts. That should tell you all you need to know. They know what they're doing over there. They know how to communicate with this very valuable audience, the This Week in Startups audience. It's super fast, it's super easy, and no credit card is required, and it's affordable. I'm telling you, it's super affordable. You have to be using it if you're doing anything in the application, internet, infrastructure space. If you're serving stuff to people. You want to make sure that they're getting the information. You want to make sure that your application is fast and tight. You need tools like New Relic, and New Relic is the best tool out there for application performance. Thank you to my friends at New Relic, and go ahead and thank at New Relic on Twitter. Okay, let's get back to the program. There are some people doing uh, uh, with delivery, like uh, the direct food that's already in the truck, mm -hmm. and, and some of that kind of stuff, you know, like closer. You think those are going to work? I, th I think they're going to do better. I think they've, uh, you know, the pea pods of the world have refined and refined and refined and they've slowly rolled out what they're trying to do. And I think they're making wiser decisions. I think that's what you saw with eBay now kind of saying they're slowing their roll. They got to refine and, and figure out what actually works. What about Walmart doing the delivery where I can bring my, is it Walmart who did that where I can bring my neighbor their Crowd, crowdsource delivery? Yeah. yeah. Like, hey, you want five bucks off your groceries, drop my neighbor's groceries off. I, it's another one I think is very interesting. I think... Um, it's kind of... T TBD is... It's going to be interesting. Huh? I find that super creepy, too. <laughs> like, some third party is now going to bring my groceries home. <laughs> Have people heard about this before? It's pretty crazy. Crowdsource um, delivery. All right, let's do the next slide here. Yeah. So um, the way we think about uh, exciting the customer, and I, I wanted to make this relevant to the audience here, it, it's not like the last audience. Um, we think about it in three different ways, and it's social networks, location, and in-store experience. So I, I kind of created a few slides to talk yep. about how we've thought about it and, and what we're working on. Um, social is pretty remarkable. I mean, we all know that it's a big deal. We all know that it's mobile. However, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, as of December, which was the first month, uh, according to this firm that published this, it's the first time that the amount of time we're spending per day has exceeded email, um, ever. So Social networks have. Social networks. Um, and for retailers, you know, if you think about mobile and how we've monetized it historically, we've done a very poor job. Um, we've just shared links. And you can see in the conversion rates, and we've seen in our conversion rates, that it's it's not that compelling. It's low one percentages, two percentages type uh, conversions. Now, there's some that are doing it a lot better, but I think um, you know there's going to be an evolution within how retailers utilize social. Um, you know, SoldZ is one that is using keyword-based purchasing and comments on Facebook. I think that's interesting, but I think until we get to a point where uh, you know Facebook, Twitter have your payment information and you've got one click access to a purchase with shipping information built in and single sign-on, we're not going to see that compelling of an experience or that high of conversion rate with social. Well, you have Twitter cards now. 
yeah. which are specifically designed interactive objects on Twitter. Right. So you can one click subscribe to an email newsletter. <clears throat> Or get a coupon, I guess. Yep. And there's some other things that you can do with them. Uh, do you think they're going to do one for one-click purchasing, or have they announced that? And they haven't announced that. I, I would be surprised if they didn't. Yeah. I mean, if if a card popped up and it was for these pair of pants, and I could select my size and my color, and they had all my billing information and shipping information, one-click purchase. I never go to the Lord and Taylor site or to the Hudson's Bay site. I mean, that's incredibly compelling. And, uh, you know, Twitter, I don't know if we just gave you the answer, but that's, uh, that's something they should do. And the celebrities on Twitter, you see them frequently engaging with brands. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, some of the celebrities are becoming angel investors, like Ashton Kutcher and Jessica Alba and others are, like, sort of getting into this. Yeah. Um, what role will they play? Because it seems like you know, Ellen and Justin Bieber are going to have tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions eventually. Now they have tens of millions of followers. But, like, what could Lord and Taylor or Saks or Barney's ever get? Like, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 followers. So are you going to be, do you see a day where Justin Bieber is like, hey, here's what I'm wearing today, and I could click the size, and I could, like, God forbid, look like him? So... I swear, guys, we didn't talk about this in L.A., and he's not setting me up for this. We uh, actually just announced that we are going to do an exclusive line with Justin Timberlake. Really? And so we are thinking of doing something very similar to what you just really? said. Really? Sorry to my boss if she's watching this on Twitter or anywhere, but yeah. um, we're going to try and do something very similar to that. I think they play a big role. I mean, they got massive cult followings, and, and with brands now being uh, you know, borderless and our ability to sell across borders is, is incredibly compelling. So this is a massive shift. You, you normally would have paid some TV network to put a Justin uh, Timberlake ad on. Yes. Or a circular or an ad or something. And now you can go directly to Justin Bieber and say, you ha or Justin Timberlake, you already have tens of millions of people. We'll just give you the money. And we'll also give Twitter probably a little bit to you know, juice it up a little bit with some you know, ads. Is that, that's the plan? That's essentially the plan. I mean, he, he's going to play a very um, influential role in the design of the merchandise. I mean, this is the brand that he wanted to create that he could wear with his friends when he went to brunch on Sunday. Um, so he's going to be a major portion of what we, we try and sell, and uh, his best friend, Trace Ayala. And they're also owning these brands now, too. So yeah. they're just, who are they disintermediating? The radio, the, net, the newspapers, the magazines, the fashion magazines are just totally disintermediated. I, uh, our entire campaign for that, um, that brand will be all digital. It will be all Instagram, social Facebook. media, uh, digitally um, for the entire run of the program. And we're going to try and do some cool things. Awesome. Let's do the next slide. And by the way, out of all those social networks, which one do you think is the most relevant to retailers? Uh, sheer volume of shares, it's Facebook. Uh, conversion, it's Instagram. Ah, so Facebook has the masses, but Instagram has like the actual buyers, like the most passionate Yeah, folks. I mean, the one that we didn't really talk about is Pinterest up there. Um, Pinterest, if you're looking for a very niche customer, female specifically, I, I can't remember the stat. I think it's close to 90%. Yes. Yeah, but if you're looking for a broader um, coverage, inclusive of male and all ages. And they're going to have promoted pins now. Right. So is that going to be something you're going to experiment with in a major way? Is that something that like you've been waiting for? Like, yeah. Why haven't they gone fast enough? Yeah, no, it's, it's something we have to experiment with. So, you know, as you can see, there were six different social media sites that were up there. Um, they just continued to grow and grow and grow, and we need to be flexible to, to try each one of them, and the ones that make more sense than others focus our funds after we've done a quick test on them. So now your skill set has to start including social media, but also content creation. Mm. Who, who's going to do all this content creation? Like the retailer who sets up you know, a store generally like they, do they even understand how social media works or what's a great vine versus a good vine versus a kind of a bummer of a vine it's fantastic question that we struggle with every day so each one of those social media channels has a different use case if you look at twitter it started with link share and then it kind of shifted probably due to the airline industry and everyone complaining about their flights yeah to a customer service model. it is it's the customer service channel so we still share the links but it's more customer service. 
to your point on Vine, Snapchat, it's not nearly as curated, professional looking campaigns. I don't know if you follow anyone on Snapchat, but a lot of it is things like if we sold this mug, it's a quick snapshot with it saying, your father need this, needs this mug for Father's Day. Yeah. So um, I think there's a portion that needs to be very, very professional, curated, like a Facebook. And then there's some other that kind of needs to be a bit of a guerrilla marketing. Yeah, I mean, Vine is just all comedy. Yeah. Right? So you're going to need to hire six second comedians. All right, let's keep going. Location? So location is incredibly interesting to me. Um, these are three screens of an iPhone um, in which we're kind of showing one of our apps, Snip Snap, um, that's got coupons from all retailers across the country. And, and the general takeaway is, is that we use it in three different ways. Banner ads, first and foremost, category search, so it's retailers that are set up by the type of product that they sell, and then location pushes. And, you know, no surprise to anyone in the audience, but you're now hearing it from a retailer, the most compelling one is location. And uh, we see the highest conversion rates with location push. And the, the thing that we're trying to do next is let's just not do it on proximity and let's do it on have they snipped a Lord & Taylor coupon before? Um, have they actually purchased with the mobile coupon code that was there? So our ability to become more and more compelling uh, in an effortless way is, is definitely something that we're focused on. Ah, uh, yes. Mandrill, transactional email from our friends at MailChimp. As you know, I love MailChimp because I send emails like crazy. But that's when it's me sending emails or my team. What about when your server, your service has to send emails? What servers and services do you sell with your service? The emails are obvious. Things like password reset. You, ha you got a friend request. Uh, you, uh, somebody posted a new photo. Uh, did you log in from this IP address? Somebody shared a document with you. All those things that your system is sending out every couple of seconds, or hopefully if your system is doing well, multiple per second. You need to make sure that those transactional emails get into people's email boxes. Because if they don't, your service is DOA. How many times have you had uh, a password reset wind up in your spam folder? How many times have you had a friend request or a message or a follow-up message get put in your spam folder? That is heartbreaking. Imagine you had that chance to re-engage a customer that you paid multiple dollars for, tens of dollars for, and they can't get back to your product or service when you have the chance to email them. Oh my God, it's a disaster. Well, you can solve that disaster with Mandrill. That's right, and they have real-time analytics so you can monitor the performance of your transactional email from your iOS or Android device. Even when you're out at the movies or having dinner or whatever you're doing, it's incredible. And the pricing is ridiculous. Like all MailChimp uh, products, they're just ridiculously generous. The first 12,000, not 1,200, 12,000 emails a month are always free. And after that, you pay a modest usage fee. And there is no feature gating. So even if you just use it for a dollar a month or $10 a month, or even if it's a free package because you're only doing under 12,000 emails because you're a startup, you still get every feature. They're not going to screw you up by taking out key features to try to get you to upgrade. They're just going to give you everything. And then when you're making enough money because you have enough emails going through the system, then they'll ask you, hey, put a credit card in and pay a little bit and help. Anyway, mail, everybody follow Mandrill app on Twitter. It's an amazing service. We use it here. It's flawless. You're going to get through those spam filters, which is critical. Uh, and people are going to love your product. Thanks again to our friends at Mandrill. Let's get back to this very important episode. And so you pay Snip Snap. Snip Snap? Yes. Yeah. And there's a couple of other couponing apps. I guess Retail Me Not is the other one. Retail Me Not, coupons.com, Shopular. Shopular. Um, and these all seem to work in the same way. You are at the mall. It tells you what the shop, shops are at the mall. You click on them, and it gives you an offer. Right. But it, when we looked at them, a lot of them seem to be just ugly copies of the circulars. Do, but these actually work? So these, what we do is we provide Snip, Snap, and Shopular a week ahead of the promotion, what will be on the promotion, mm -hmm. so that they're aware of exclusions, they're aware of the creative, creative. If you see that friends and family, that was what we used for our latest friends and family that ended yesterday. Um, so and that's we, supposed to be friends and family of the people who work at Lord & Taylor, but it's like, hey, we're going to let you in on this because you have this app. Yes, yes, that's right. So diluting that a little bit, but through a specific channel, maybe. Yep, yep. Has um, anybody used one of these coupon, couponing apps ever? Has anybody? See, these are all affluent people who don't use coupons, I don't think. Like, I, I would totally use Brandon, this. Brandon had his hand up back Brandon there. used it? Okay, cool, Brandon. Um, so, uh, who, are these bargain hunters who use these, or affluent people, or uh, what? 
we've seen a mix. I mean, I think it depends on the retailer. You know, we're lucky enough to have four different types of retail brands. Uh, you look at Lord & Taylor, it's a, you know, promotional retailer. So we see a lot of traction with this. You shift that over to a Hudson's Bay, it's not nearly as promotional, so we don't see as much of it. Mm. But I, I think the general takeaway is, is that we need to be a part of all these various apps. The app world has segmented completely and it feels like there's a new one popping up every day that I need to make sure our creative is getting to. Um, but and there's no standard for any of this. Right, right. In terms of location-based ads. Right. I mean, the mobile banners are not standardized really. No. Yeah. Okay. But this, I mean, this is four million down, I think three and a half to four million downloads. It's um, an example of an app that we think is done very aesthetically well and it's, it's very clean relative to some of the other couponing apps. But is it driving significant traffic conversions or would you say this is sort of still in the nascent category? Uh, or slightly better than nascent? Slightly better than nascent. So dozens of people a day or something like that? Hundreds? Yeah. 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 Okay. On the, cool. bigger, on the bigger events, probably close to hundreds. Oh, wow. So that is yeah. poised for success then. Okay. Okay, so in-store experience, and this is, don't worry guys, I'm gonna stay tech-oriented, but this is probably the only slide in which we're gonna talk about. We still need to provide interactive full-service experiences, and, and I've got four different screenshots of various things that we have done in the last couple of years. Um, the top left, we got a bridal um, provider named Kleinfeld to come in and basically build out- From Bay Ridge. Full, yep, yeah, full bridal salon. Um, and we dedicated an enormous amount of square, square footage so that that person could come in, could, could run through their bridal registry, have their friends and family there. Top right is the you know, adjacent gift registry, so if it's outside of bridal, they can, they can sit and uh, work with our shoppers. Bottom left is a cook um, location where we've got you know, top chefs to come in and to do uh, events, and then bottom right is, you know, to our Nespresso uh, conversation. I yeah. threw in a, a shot of our Nespresso. So again, the point here is, is that we still need to have a reason for our shoppers to come to a department store. A lot of retail has moved to specialty. So, you know, the Michael Kors, the Express, the, they're very quick come in, come out uh, retailers and, and we're a department store, so there needs to be a reason for them to stay around. Um, and it's not always just the selection of merchandise. Well, these uh, like Nespresso stores, I'm kind of fascinated by these. Like I would never buy one of those machines because I, I kind of think the imp environmental impact of those pods has got to be terrible. But I did spend time at the Nespresso one at, uh, in San Francisco, mm -hmm. right off the uh, Union Square there. And my God, is it the like, most amazing place to sit and work and just have a nice cup of espresso. I mean, it had service that was on the level of like going to the Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. um, do those places actually make money or do they lose money? Uh, do you think? I can't comment specifically on espresso. For the most part, they do uh, a halo effect that makes money for the store. Ah, so they may lose a little bit, may break even, but they get people to hang out. Cost of entry. Gotcha. Okay, great. Okay, so let's, let's talk about um, smartphones. I think the takeaway from this slide is, you know, everyone's got smartphones, and guess what? Everyone's using them to shop in some way, shape, or form. But the use cases today, you know, for lack of a better term, they're, they're, they're quite lame. And I think it's going to evolve considerably. I mean, a lot of it is price compare, and we all see that. A lot of it is figuring out where locations are and what hours are and promo offers. And I think it's early days. And I think the one point I want to make about the use of smartphones in stores is customers we're finding are more interested in self-sufficiency. So instead of working with a customer service agent or working with a sales associate, a lot of them would rather do it themselves on their phone if they're provided the ability to do so. Okay, so you accept that, that's just the future. That's, that's what we're seeing. Granted, um, it's, it's certain populations. Right. However, a lot of them are definitely moving that way. And, you know, I think a lot of people two years ago would have said that, you know, their grandmothers would have never shopped online, but, you know, we've got a lot of that now. Yeah. So My it, mom's a grandma now, and she's shopping online. So seamless omni-channel transactions, what does that mean? So 
Today, I think um, we don't do a great job, retailers in general, of allowing the customer to come into the store and then letting the customer know that instead of taking this home, they can get it sent to another store or sent to their home very seamlessly and quickly. Today, they need to go into the store, they need to go to a customer service rep and say, hey, do you have this, uh, you know, th your shirt that you can send in a medium to my home in Bayshore? And that's, it's just a, it's a poor transaction. If they are interacting with a beacon or if they're able to pull it up online really quickly, do single checkout, I think it's, it'd be a lot more seamless and better experience for them. So how do you envision that happening? How are you pursuing that? Like, do I take out your Lord & Taylor app and scan the QR code and then it's asked me for the quantity and then I just say ship? Yes, so that, that's one possible way that we could do it. Um, another possible way that we're working on in Beacons in a, in a couple slides we'll see is, is the ability to scan all the products that are within that particular location and click one-click checkout using the, uh, the information you got there. Great. Let's go to the next one. So what we're doing here is uh, just showing a quick preview of the Beacon ecosystem deployment. So this is what we found. We deployed beacons. People, when they knew how to use them, our customers, when they knew how to use them, it was an incredibly compelling experience. We saw a lot of engagement. Um, but for the most part, you know, it, it's not self-sufficient and it takes a lot of effort. And what I mean by that is, is a lot of our customers that are coming into stores, one, have never been into our department store or our tourists, aren't familiar with the brand, don't have our app. And so what we found was is taking the SDK that we utilize with Swirl and talking to our bigger app providers and saying, you integrate it for us, and then it's a more effortless experience for those that are using those apps. So we've got a number of apps that we're going to have the SDK loaded into and across 15 locations in the US and Canada with at least eight experiences per store, limited to two, because we don't want to inundate. Um, we're going to have apps ranging uh, you know, from three million downloads up to 70 million downloads acquiring new Lord & Taylor and Hudson's Bay customers. So I happen to download Dots or Two Dots or right. whatever. That's not one. Whatever game or something way. like that, and then I get to get alerts based on having that game, or is this like a Foursquare thing or what? Uh, yeah, so uh, let's say you're listening to a music app as you're walking by a store. Got it. You will get a swirl screen to pop up. That first one that's got Rihanna, um, and it will say, hey, have you realized there's a 25% sale going at Lord & Taylor? Ah, so if I had something, say, like a Pandora or something I was listening to, instead of getting a normal Pandora ad, I might get a Lord & Taylor Pandora ad because I was near a Lord & Taylor. Exactly. So I don't need the Lord & Taylor app. So that would be incredible. Exactly. I mean, now you're going to go how many fold? Yep. In terms of usage, it might be thousands of times more people using Pandora on a regular basis or some other streaming music service, Spotify or whatever. Exactly. It becomes an acquisition tool as, a, as opposed to a retention tool, which when we force them to download our app. Yeah. That's fascinating. Okay. And so how have the app developers responded to that? Are they stoked to have a new revenue stream or do they feel like they might lose customers because of it? I mean, in the case of Pandora, it would just be a different type of ad. Right. Um, you know, Sonic Notify could probably answer this question as well. I think everyone's talking about beacons, but no one's really doing anything. Yeah. It's kind of lame. That's kind of why we're here, yeah. So, it, it, like, let's get this show on the road yeah. is, is kind of what I've told them. And I, I've just said, look, we are going to launch this. We are going to be a major department store in two different countries with four different banners that are going to do this. And we're going to figure out whether we think it's compelling or not. And... Are you coming along for the ride or not? And they've resoundingly said yes. So I think it's going to be phenomenal. I'm excited. I mean, if, I wonder, let me just ask this question. If somebody, let's pretend Mac is your, you know, one of your five favorite brands. Would you, would anybody here, I'll ask if you think it's cool or you would be offended. And if neither, you can not raise your hand. But if you got, while listening to Pandora or Spotify, a 20% off discount, um, to your favorite brand, whatever it happens to be, how many people here would be stoked or think that was cool when they're listening to Pandora? Okay, I'm part of that group. How many people would be annoyed and be offended that Pandora was sending them an offer? Did you say yes to the push notifications when you downloaded the app? 
I guess that's a question because if this is going to be the learning is like, I don't think consumers are expecting this. So if they said yes to push notifications, did that mean push notifications that are marketing messages or not? And then because it's a discount and because it's relevant because it's so close, I kind of feel like it's forgivable if it's, I mean, if it was annoying and it wasn't a good discount. Right. Yeah. I mean, th this is the gray line. When, when we have these apps re-released, we got to make sure that we are crystal clear. Because the last thing that I want is, you know, whoever this music listener is, their first engagement with Lord and Taylor is something that annoys them. And yeah. that means I have not done my job and I should be fired. You know what would be so. great is if it said the next two hours of streaming music are presented free by your friends at Lord and Taylor. That's cool. Like I'll, you actually I'll gave have to, me. Because usually what do you hear? Like a Pandora ad every like 15 minutes or something? So this would be like, oh, I, I get one ad, but I don't have to hear the other nine or something. Yep, effortless, doesn't require a call to action, and maybe if they accepted it on the next run by, they, they get a actual discount. Yeah, okay, keep going, okay. So that, that is the extent of, of the presentation, but I think, I just wanted to make a couple points. Again, customers aren't binary, we, we all proved that in here. We all said that we're not all show rumors. Um, retail's hot right now, it's very cool, there's a lot of stuff going on, um, you know, in the middle, there are a number of customers that we need to engage with and we need to figure out how we're engaging with them. Um, and I think we need to be focused on how the customers change, not, not how we want to push the customer to how we should engage with them. Um, but it's, it's an exciting time and I think the more that we can make the tech that we're using to engage the customer passive and effortless, the greater um, likelihood we're going to have better conversion and we're going to see uh, you know, more excited customers. Awesome. So do we have any uh, Twitter questions? Uh, or do we want to just run a uh, microphone? Who has a question? We have uh, one here and then one here. We'll do that in that order. And while he's running the microphone, oh, okay, we got the microphone very quick. Thanks. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for coming out and talking to us today. Thank I'm you. wondering how you guys are using mobile and anything you're thinking about with beacons to increase more like personalization and customization in the in-store experience versus just sort of pushing ads? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, so it kind of goes back to that location comment that I had before. The more pers personalized we can make it, uh, the higher likelihood of conversion and the higher likelihood of delighting the customer. Um, there's nothing worse than me receiving an email from, uh, a retailer that's talking about handbags. I don't ever shop for handbags. Why am I getting a email about handbags? So the more and more we can personalize it, the better, to your point. What we're doing is, is we're looking for ways to take the purchase history of that customer, build it into the rationale as to what we're actually gonna push their way. Um, the tough thing that we've got or the challenge we've got is, is so much of sales today are, are, are done through affiliates and done through other parties. And, um, you know, I was just talking to MCX at, at lunch. It's done with information that we don't necessarily have access to. So the closer we can get access to that information, the easier it can be to personalize. And then, in turn, the conversion rates goes, go up. You know what would be cool, too, is when you show that Mac ad, which obviously, like, um, most men are not going to be super interested in unless they're buying a gift or right. something or any a number of reasons. But um, having a little like thin one third bar that was like, hey, how about Axe spray or, or something else, right. right? Right. So some other thing that might appeal to the opposite of whatever the ad is. And then you could track which did that user ID click on yep. and start putting them into either or buckets. Yep. You know, like yep. which, which would you find more appealing, this or this coupon? Pick one. Uh, okay, another question? Hi, I have a question about um, uh, the future of retail as uh, purely showrooms. I was wondering, you know, um, just uh, how long in the future do you think that's going to come about? And as well as if, if you know if, if uh, mm. anyone's doing that on a larger scale currently with the automated right, mobile checkout. Uh, Jason and I have actually spoken about this at length. I think it's what's interesting to us is that um, there's a lot of retail space out there. And as the retail sales shift to online, something's got to happen with that retail space. Either doors need to shrink, doors need to become more fulfillment centers, or they need to close down. I'm not here to tell you whether I think it's, it's one or the other or when it's going to happen, but I think, you know, naturally every single retailer is behind closed doors trying to figure out what is the mix. 
I mean, how much of your space should you no longer sell in and how much should you fulfill in? And, you know, should you potentially look at opening much smaller doors? And it's definitely something we have to think about quite a bit because we have Goliaths. We have, you know, 11-story stores where we're selling every single product under the sun. Oh, so do you see a time when the top two or three floors or whatever are, you know, storage so that you could have more uh, inv or just the delivery going from there, like the UPS would go from that location, you're saying? Yeah, I think, I think there's actually been some retailers, some that are actually even in the audience, that have publicly said they're devoting more space to fulfillment. Um, what we've had to do is, now that we're using all our doors, basically, as bless you, as pseudo DCs, we are now shifting some of the labor to fulfillment, so they're packing boxes as opposed to customer facing, and we're ah. shifting some of the sales space to fulfillment. Makes total sense. Uh, I'll take a final question. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to go back to that example that you were giving of the Mac ad coming through in Pandora, um, how do you ensure that sort of the advertisements that you're, or the promotions that you're giving to third-party apps are relevant to the people receiving them? And does that put the onus on the third-party apps to be providing the information to target those ads? Yeah, yeah. So, so great question. Thanks. And one, I just want to make sure that the app Example was Pandora, but it's not Pandora. Yeah. Uh, and Mac will probably be one of the providers. Um, again, take SnipSnap, for example, because SnipSnap is one that's going to be integrating the Swirl SDK. They've got information behind the scenes that says this shopper has clipped coupons previously from Lord & Taylor. They've also got information behind the scenes that says they've clipped apparel-based retailers, some that may even be our competition. That's you know, the first level of rele relevancy. And then they've even got the information that says that, that customer has taken that clipped coupon and then converted in store because we give them a specific mobile coupon code. So we can get to those three layers. Um, what I can't get to today, but I need to get to, and we will eventually get there, is what they've specifically bought in the store, mm. right? So I can say, I know that this customer has gone to a Lord & Taylor or a Hudson's Bay. I know that they've converted. Let's send them a normal coupon. But I can't say, I know this person bought that shirt. Let's send them you know, a coupon for that specific shirt or that specific brand. Got it. OK, final question. Final, final question. Seems like we get very different expectations from customers about privacy in e-commerce yeah. and privacy in bricks and mortar. And I'm interested in how you see this evolving. Um, I mean, what's the perspective you guys hear? Well, I'm coming from the tech side, so we're guessing at what you think you want us to build for you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, which is why I'm up here on stage, huh? So, um, I hate to stereotype, but age-wise, you know, the younger, the millennials uh, definitely aren't nearly as concerned with privacy as beyond millennials. Um, essentially, what we found where you accept push notifications in app, let's just talk in app, uh, you're willing to be sent push notifications quite easily. You don't have any worry about privacy. Where we do have problems is where we start tracking based on Wi-Fi. You know, if, if, if they jump onto our Wi-Fi, they're very upset privacy-wise, even if they've signed up and said yes. So we've, we've kept Wi-Fi, but we've, we've stopped tracking, and we did that very quickly, quick response. Um, so I, I think a lot of it's down to age, unfortunately, but I think it's slowly but, slowly but surely turning a bit. I don't know if that answered your question. It's a tough question. It's a gray line, like I said before, and, and last thing we want to do is not delight the customer. We want to um, make sure that they are not experience the brand in a way in which feels invasive. Let's hear it for Ryan. Uh, well done. Thank you, awesome. Sir.